Hello, and welcome to It's Always Sunny in Hollywood. Actually, wait. No, drop the it's. Just Always Sunny in Hollywood. Cleaner that way. Welcome to Always Sunny in Hollywood. I am your host, Patrick. I'm another host, Lugia. Uh, and I'm the last host, uh, Red Drumart. Yes, today um, we're taking a spin on the techno set and going surfing on the social net work. Yeah. All right. Um, anyway, news. Uh, why don't you start off, Patrick? What do you got? Actually, I I wanna I want Lugia to start. Okay. Because I legit don't know what he's gonna talk about. Are you sure you don't know? I feel like you know. Oh wait, yeah. I think yeah. I have a guess. Um, say it. All right. So uh, a couple of days ago, we got confirmation on a Scott Pilgrim anime. Oh, that isn't what I thought you were gonna say. But really? I have heard about that. I thought you were going to bring up how E3 isn't happening anymore. I mean, that too, but like, who cares about E3? Yeah. Fair enough. The only, the only person that cares about E3 is the guy that posts the, um, the Brian Griffin news. Mm-hmm. That was a great E3 this year. Um, yeah, no, the Scott Pilgrim anime, um, not only was it announced, but they confirmed that the entire original cast is coming back. Radical. Which should be interesting, because I don't really think Michael Cera is particularly accurate to the comic, but uh, everyone else is, But so I guess, you know, you can't bring back everyone else, but not Michael Cera. Not only know, that, it's, it's being directed by Edgar Wright, who also directed the movie. Uh, I don't know if he's being directed by Edgar Wright, but I know he's involved. The studio is Science Saru, who, um, they're, uh, they're known for their work with uh, Yuasa. This is an actual anime, by the way. Yeah, Science Saru is an actual anime st- studio. This isn't like a case of like Castlevania where people say it's anime, but it's not really. Uh, they directed that Food Chain episode of Adventure Time, if any of you remember that one. What Jeez, season I... was that? Like six? No, I then I didn't it. see it. Man, I haven't watched Adventure Time in years. I don't even remember what season I stopped at. All right. In terms of um, like their, their actual work that they're known for, you know, they did Ping Pong the Animation, um, Devil Man Cry Baby, Keep Your Hands Up, Izuken. You know, um, th- those are decently popular. Oh, the Tatami Galaxy. Oh, they also directed uh, two episodes of Space Dandy. Again, that you doesn't help. Dandy. Okay, I figured uh, Lugia might know Space Dandy. I've heard of Space Dandy. I've never seen it for myself, though. Okay, That yeah. is one dandy space. Honestly, I think that's an actual line in the show at one point. Wait, really? <laughs> space Dandy is a comedy. It's, it's, it's absurd. It's hilarious. Yeah. <laughs> Do you know what Space oh, Dandy is? Maybe I am a writer. You know what Space Dandy is? What, what is it? Space Dandy is the creator of Cowboy Bebop saying, what if we made a parody of Cowboy Bebop? He's the first man to ever be like, I'm going to parody my own work. Legend. Huh. Yeah. How about that? Maybe I'll, maybe I'll check it out then. That's yeah, pretty short. It's only uh, 16 episodes. Not, no, uh, 26 episodes. They even did uh, two, two of the shorts in Star Wars Visions. So um, I guess that's that's probably why like they uh they hired him because like they're they've done like anime inspired American work before. So perfect fit for Scott Pilgrim, honestly. Also, like they tend to have like a looser style, not like the typical anime style. Um, they've even like adapted some Tezuka stuff, which is like the most obvious influence of a uh, Scott Pilgrim. So uh, yeah. now, do you think it's going to be a direct translation from the comics, or are they going to take a new art direction with it? I think it's going to be pretty faithful to the comics. The thing is, like, I've seen the studio's other work, and the other work, it would fit this art style of the comic, like, really well. Like, it'd, it'd probably be, like, damn close if it's not, um... I guess, like, don't try to reinvent the wheel? I don't know. If, uh, have any of you seen uh, Scott Pilgrim, the animation, the short film? Yeah, I have not. Yeah, basically just, like, adapted, like, a chapter from the, the comic. But, yeah, um, I imagine it's... It's probably going to be, like, a better art style than that, but, like, it's probably going to have a similar vibe. Um, that was, like, an animated short film that, you know, Ed, uh, Edgar Wright made as, like, for to promote the movie. Um, Is that about do it for Scott Pilgrim? I guess so. Yeah. All right. I got a little something. I don't know, I don't know if you guys have seen this, but we finally got a new trailer for Pixar's upcoming film, Elemental. And I gotta yes. say, it is a feast for the eyes. I have not seen it because, I'll be honest, the movie hasn't really interested me. So, uh, I don't know, I, I just didn't feel compelled. Dude, it is insanely colorful. I have not even heard of this. 
to be honest, I don't even watch like trailers of movies I'm I'm interested in anymore because um like Wes Anderson, he had a new trailer and I was like, I mean I'm I already know I'm gonna watch the movie, so like you know, why bother watch the trailer? Yo, know, is I this just watch. Shark Boy and Lava Girl? No, Not exactly, no. It's no, it's, it's a world it's, where it's cool math games one. Yeah, <laughs> fire no, it's, girl and fire boy and water girl. It's a world where a bunch of elements live. Like there's fire fire people, water people, earth people, wind people. And a fire girl and a water boy meet and fall in love, but you know, they can't actually touch each other because they don't mix. Evaporation. Basically. And I'm I'm very interested to see where they go with this because the world looks very interesting. And not only um, that, but apparently this movie is also bringing back the old Pixar tradition of putting a short before the film because their last few movies haven't done that. Yeah, but that's because their last few movies were like direct streaming. Yeah, not even. I mean, Lightyear was in theaters and that didn't have a short. Oh. I remember I, I, remember I, t I took my dad to see it and like that's... That's his favorite, like one of his favorite things of seeing a Pixar film to see what shorts before, but there was no short. And he's like, "What?" Wait, his favorite thing about seeing a Pixar film is not seeing a Pixar film. No, no, his one of his favorite things is seeing the short film beforehand. Listen, I listen, know, I'm just making a joke. When I go to a listen, when I go to a restaurant, I like the main meal, but at the same time, <laughs> the appetizer is kind of the best part, you know. Well, but I'll be honest, I'm disappointed that one of my favorite Pixar traditions they don't do anymore. That's the Jeffrey, uh, the no, the John Ratzenberger cameo. I don't do that anymore. Well, I mean, were those even like cameos? He, he usually just played like an actual character. Well, I mean, like a brief like character with like a few lines of dialogue, but that's it. Yeah, okay. Other than like Toy Story and Cars, I can't really think of another movie where he was actually like, kind of a big role. He was in uh, Kingdom Hearts. He was. You know what I mean. You know what I mean. Listen, he, he, that, that's the most important cameo. His Kingdom Hearts Whatever. cameo is the best one. Um, Regardless, yeah. I am looking forward to Elemental, which releases in June. And actually, you got quite a few animated options in June. You got Spider-Man, you got Elemental, and you got Ruby Gilman. So, yeah. you got options. Apparently, uh, Ratzenberger is going to cameo in uh, Luck. That movie already happened. Oh, it already came out? It came out last year. And that's... Is it good? I didn't hear anyone talking I've, about it. I've, I've heard it's not great. I thought we talked about this recently. Like it was coming yeah. out. I'm with Red know. on this one. I've heard nothing yeah. about this. It was, a, it, was a, it was a direct to streaming movie. I I don't know. I guess people didn't care. I'm I haven't I mean I haven't seen it. I need to see if like anyone I know have seen it. Luck, Peggy Holmes. Or uh, you could see the movie yourself and form your own opinion. No, why Whatever. would I waste my time if I'm not interested? I just want to know if like anyone I know has seen All right, it and recommend it. It looks like a mixed it, bag. Like... So, I mean, I don't know if it would be worth your time. I don't know, it's a neat concept. It? Peggy Holmes? Who Peggy does? Holmes. Peggy Holmes has apparently directed some of the Tinkerbell movies. I haven't seen any of the Tinkerbell movies. I haven't seen any of the Tinkerbell movies too, but I, I remember the ads because... Oh yeah, me too. Fucking play the shit out of those ads. Uh, I, I, when I was a kid, I was a big fan of Disney's Peter Pan, and Tinkerbell was one of my favorite characters, but... Oh, yeah, like, no. The, the, Tinker, the Tinkerbell, Tinkerbell movies came out, sense. like, when I was Tinker, older. The thing is, like, Tinkerbell's such a great character in the Peter Pan things, but all the trailers for, like, the solo Tinkerbell stuff makes it feel like that's, like, a different character. Like... Like Barbie, almost? Yeah, because, like, she seems like... She you know, talks! The She's all nice and Disney-fied when um, Tinkerbell and Peter Pan is a complete bitch. She's yeah. hilarious. That's what makes her, that's what makes her great. That's what makes her great. That's that's what makes her great. It's She's for the kids, to, though. She tries to kill Wendy. She's an asshole, and also they have a joke about her having a big ass for some reason. Yeah. In the 1940s. 50s. I don't know, like, what... It was 1950? Okay. 1953, if memory serves. I don't know what the hell Disney was cooking back then, but it was great. Regardless. That, anyway, that, element, that, anyway, that, Elemental looks cool. Red, what's your final thing? Oh, yes. Um, so we haven't done a modern movie review in a while because I haven't seen many modern stuff. I don't know if any of us has, but I saw Creed 3 the other day. Uh, I love Rocky and it's on VOD. So um, I got it. One, if you're a fan of the Rocky movies, obviously you're going to like this. There are no bad Rocky movies. Um, but I will say this is actually on the upper end of the Rocky series. Like This is one of the better ones. Not sure where I'd put it, but it's uh, not as good as Creed 1, better than Creed 2. Uh, but ignoring the ra ranking, let me just get into it. Um, I feel like this is the movie where it finally kind of became its own thing. It doesn't feel 
like a legacy sequel. This just feels like another Creed movie. Like, Rocky, at this point, like, the series kind of finally moved past, like, Rocky Shadow, and I think that's kind of cool. It's, uh, some people are, like, predicting, it's like, oh, is it going to be about Clubber Landscape? It's like, no, this is just someone in Creed's, like, own personal life that he's fighting. Um, and I think it's better that way, that it's not, you know, tied to Rocky's thing anymore. I thought Michael that's what they were right. going for anyway, just making it about Creed and not so much Rocky, despite it being a spinoff of that franchise. So they struggled keeping the focus on him, is what you're saying? The first Creed movie, and this, it was very much like, it was very much about like his relationship with Rocky, and Creed 2 was very much about like the fallout of Rocky 4, because um, Creed's fucking dad got murdered in rocky 4 um this is the first one where it has no connections to the rocky series um and it, it's just about creed and i think that's interesting okay michael b jordan directed this which uh you know makes sense you know stallone directed a lot of the movies after um a bit uh i would say he has a lot of jordan has a ton of potential um so basically jordan's like um been very open about being a fan of anime and you can tell watching this because uh it's got that similar kind of um it's got a similar visual language to a lot of shonen anime like dragon ball or hajime no Ippo and stuff and by the end of the film the it straight up becomes like uh the fights aren't even like literal it becomes completely expressionistic and symbolic um there's this like one point in the final fight where like the entire crowd disappears and like they have like the it becomes like a cage match almost and it's entirely like symbolism and i think that that was like pretty cool and dramatically it's uh pretty familiar but i like how they kind of frame things differently because um like on paper uh the villain of the film or the antagonist is the rocky balboa character you know being like this underdog so i think it's interesting how they uh th this is probably like the first of the rocky films that actually kind of plays with your sympathies a bit because like you kind of understand both sides fully and you kind of root for both sides and um i think that makes like the climax kind of interesting i don't know why but i while i think all the climaxes of the creed movies are good they never quite hit me like the same way that like the climaxes of the rocky films do even though like they're more visually engaging fights and like on paper dramatically it fits um not to say like the climax wasn't dramatically hard but like it's, i don't know what it's about like the rocky films in particular that make it hit harder but i don't know Maybe it's just because of, like, the kind of cheesy earnest stuff of them. Pack more of a punch, but it's... Yeah. Um, but still pretty good. Uh, I really like how sign language was uh, handed so naturally in this film. There was a ton of sign language in it. And um, I want to make a joke that Michael B. Jordan likes anime so much that um, he made the audience read subtitles here. But, uh, no, like, I, it, I, it's actually kind of cool because, like, um... I don't know if you guys remember, but uh, Creed's wife uh, does have uh, hearing issues. So they just kind of, like, commit to the characters using more and more sign language. And in this film, like, they just straight up, like, use sign language a ton, like, in their private lives. Um, because their daughter is deaf. And yeah, this uh, also, Creed has a daughter in this film, and they kind of explore that, so that's kind of cool. One slight detriment to the film is um, because it's finally broken away from the Rocky series, uh, they do not use the Rocky theme in the film. Um, and that's just a shame because uh, that is the greatest theme song uh, ever, in my opinion. Um, they do have like a little bit of the fanfare after he wins, but you know. Um, uh, if you like shonen anime or if you like Rocky, check it out. Pretty good film. Anyway, uh, Social Network. The Social Network, right. So, <clears throat> The Social Network was directed by David Fincher, and it's based on the book The Accidental Billionaires by Ben Mesrich. And the story of how it got to be a movie is that Aaron Sorkin actually got a little preview of the book, The Accidental Billionaires, and he loved it so much from what he read that he decided to acquire the rights to make it into a movie before it was even finished. By the time the book was finished, he had written 80% of the screenplay. I don't have a ton regarding the production history. I do have some fun facts, though. One is that uh, probably the movie's most famous scene, the one where Andrew Garfield smashes the computer, that took like 40 takes to get right. How many computers did they have to break? Yes. Like 40. <laughs> yes is not a number. How, however many takes, that's how many computers they broke. Could have been more. You never know. Another fun fact is that uh, the real Mark Zuckerberg originally had no intention of seeing this movie. He eventually did. And while he didn't like it, he did give them credit 
they managed to get every single shirt he ever wore correct in the film. Like, every outfit that Jesse Eisenberg wears, he said, is a shirt he actually owned. And, like, how did they do that? He, yeah, will, give I, them, I, he will give them credit for that. It's very obvious why Zuckerberg wouldn't like this movie. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, but anyway, Social Network released in 2010, and it was very highly critically acclaimed. And it won a few Oscars, being Best Adapted Screenplay, Best Original Score, and Best Film Editing. And against a budget of forty million, it made two hundred and twenty-five million. And nowadays, it is considered not only one of the best films of the twenty tens, but also one of the best films of the twenty first century thus far. This, alongside Fight Club, are like considered uh, Fincher's opus. Um, and also, speaking of the Oscars, the Social Network losing uh, the Oscars was actually like considered one of the, like the most controversial moments in the Oscars uh, up until that point. You know, up right up there with like. Uh, uh, what you want to call it? Um, a Lego movie not getting nominated? No. Okay. Oh, Brokeback Mountain not winning uh, to, and losing to Crash. Crash. Anyway, so we, we briefly talked about this last week. Our exposure with The Social Network is that Red has seen it. I have heard of it but never seen it. And Lugia has never heard of it before. Yes. I am still surprised at that. I am surprised considering... too because everyone around me has heard of it. I even asked yeah, my parents. Yeah, I'm like, have you heard of The Social Network? They said, yeah. We have. Like, we thought you'd watch it because, you know, it, it was popular. I'm like, no! This was never brought to my attention in any capacity. I think it's crazy because, like, you know David Fincher. Yeah. <laughs> well, not personally. Yeah, but, like, you've seen his movies. Yeah. Seen, like, like, it's his most famous movie. And what's even weirder is that, okay, so I did see that Mad clip that you sent me earlier, Patrick, and I do remember that. I never associated it with the social network, though. I just thought it was, like, some dumb skit when I was young. Like, I didn't know who Jesse Eisenberg was or Andrew Garfield or Mark Zuckerberg, for that matter. So it just went over my head. I just remember Mordecai and Rigby making a cameo. Well, now you have full context. Yep. <laughs> Getting old is weird. It is. So in terms of... So what is the social network about? Well... Facebook! It's... it's... It's a villain origin story. It's about how Mark Zuckerberg became uh, the madman we know today, basically. Or at the very least, it's chapter one of that story, how he screwed over his friend. This is how he turned into a reptile. Yeah, no, no, in, in all seriousness, it really is a Mark Zuckerberg villain origin story. Yeah, no, I, I know who you're saying. Nah, we're agreeing like, with I, you. <laughs> like, like, I'm joking, but at the same time, that, that really is what the movie is. <laughs> And yeah, we can easily see why Mark Zuckerberg was not a fan because, my God, he's an asshole. Anyway, um, so yeah, this is one of my favorite movies. You know, if it's not a masterpiece, it's pretty damn close. What I find like particularly compelling about this movie is um, I actually have a lot of uh, issues with um, Aaron Sorkin as a writer, but I feel this like this film in particular really manages to like. I don't know if it was, like, Fincher's input, but, like, I feel like it, this movie highlights the best of Aaron Sorkin's writing. It, like, doesn't have any of his, like, weaknesses, which um, I think is interesting. Like, uh, to compare it to another kind of similar film, he did a movie about Steve Jobs, and it's not bad. It's, it's good, but um, it doesn't have, like, the, the flavor this one does. So what is, uh, what is the meat and potatoes of the plot aside from Mark Zuckerberg? Okay, well, it's Mark Zuckerberg creating Facebook and getting sued by the Winklevoss twins because they claim they stole his idea for Facebook. And he's also getting countersued by his best friend, Eduardo, because he was kind of screwed over in terms of how much of the company he would get. And there's also this other guy, played by Justin Timberlake, who's trying to say how they can make Facebook a better and bigger company. It's really the evolution of how Facebook became so big. At the very least, up until, like, 2007, I think? When does, yeah. when does the movie end? What year? Did they specify? It basically ends at the end of, like, the trial. And it's so... It's interesting watching this movie from, you know, a 2023 perspective, because this is a movie released in 2010. So much shit has happened with Mark Zuckerberg and Facebook. Yeah. And the it's not even Facebook anymore. Years. It's called Meta now. Yeah. He's become only more and more evil. This film was 100% right about everything they said. Slowly but surely, his scales are showing. <laughs> no, yeah, I, I had a really good time with this one. Yeah, no, it's... Yeah, no, this was great. 
Um, like not to jump the gun, but I, I want to make it very clear. I'm giving this a 10 out of 10. I, I generally think like, like Fight Club might be my favorite Fincher movie. This is probably his best one though. Fascinating little character study with um, Zuckerberg. Cause like I, the way this movie ends, like that ending, like really fucking got me. Just him like- With uh, him refreshing the page on Erica, the yeah. first date, yeah. Like especially like considering like, um, you know, like Facebook basically started as like a like his his like first cl claim to fame like pre Facebook was because um he made like the website rating women and stuff. So like this, it kind of explores his like weird issues with women throughout the film, which I think is interesting. Justin Timberlake, this basically like kickstarted his acting career, and um I think like you can understand why he actually like he put in the work. This was a good fucking um performance. Yeah, that, that's the word, performance. This is a good performance. I, I feel it's so hard to talk about this film just because, like, it's... There's a lot about it. Um, what do you guys think of cinematography? Overall, pretty this good. Movie, yeah, but... This movie is... This isn't a criticism or anything, it's just an observation. This movie is really dark. Yeah. Well, when the topic is Mark Zuckerberg, I think it's fitting. Um, yes, I but like it's... What what okay. I find interesting about the direction is that like, it's about I, I I just find it um fascinating because like I can't like highlight like any like specific like directing ticks but um I just find it impressive how they were able to make such a boring topic like um building a website row rowing um legal stuff and they made it like like a mainstream like accessible thriller which is like interesting to me. Um, I think it I helped that about... we get some uh, flash forwards to the present where they're disputing these legal uh, yeah. mm -hmm. matters. Yeah, like the way they like edit ev edit everything is like really well. Um, there's a lot of like very smooth camera movements, which I uh, I'm not sure if like you noticed, but um, it's something I I, I noticed more like on rewatch. But like uh, a lot of very like smooth camera movements that are like um, they really like hook you. They really draw your attention. The rowing scenes I thought was very interesting, like the way they kind of highlight and make it visceral. Even though, like, I've seen like foot rowing before, I've seen footage of rowing. It's a boring ass sport. Um, but they the way they shot it, I was like, man, that shit's fucking badass. But that though, one, that one scene where the the instrumental score is in the hall of the mountain king. Yeah, that, that, that whole scene with with the twins and everything that was great. Actually, talk about the music for a second. This score, like, I know the people who who did the score also did the music for Soul, the Pixar film. Which they also won an Oscar for, well uh, deserved. Yeah. Um. So just based off that knowledge, I'm gonna yeah, take it that you don't know who the people who scored it are. No, I know. I know who they are. I know I, the, the guy from Nine Inch Nails. Okay. Yeah. I was like, no, I know that. <laughs> I know Nine that. Nails. I was like, you can tell it's Nine Inch Nails. It's very <laughs> much industrial music. Um. Soul is honestly like Soul to me is like the, the most insane shit they've ever scored because it sounds nothing like their other work. Because, like, it, it's got, like, that, like, the ethereal techno stuff isn't even, like, the type of ethereal stuff they usually do. And um, it explores jazz. Well, like, um, they've scored most of Fincher's other films. Like, they've done Gone Girl, Social Network, Girl with the Dragon Tattoo, Mank. And so, actually, I think this might have been the first movie they did with him. But, like, ever since this film, he's scored all of Fincher's, like, other projects. Well, it's but, great uh, stuff. Yeah, you know, I guess you, you understand why Fincher was like, yeah, I'm going to stick with you for the rest of my career. I always find it interesting when, like, musicians become like like movie scores like they, composers they, yeah movie composers um most famous examples obviously danny elfman going from oingo boingo to uh probably one of the most prolific um film composers next to like john williams um but i was also uh <laughs> like i'm a huge fan of uh, my bloody valentine and i found out that they they were the uh the guitarist of the band um he scored uh, some uh, Gregoraki movies, and I was like, oh, that's very interesting. You know, a cult filmmaker directing a bunch of, uh, doing the score to a bunch of cult film. That's kind of cool. There's also movie. Mark Mothersbaugh from Devo. He's a really big film composer. Yeah, so I just find that, like, interesting, because, like, the purpose of um, a film score is, like, it's, it's supplementary material. It's supporting a grander idea versus, um, like like a album on its own that is itself the artistic statement it's not like an extra layer so i just think it's interesting how they're kind of able to shift from being the driving voice to being a supporting voice and i think that's kind of cool
What a time to be alive. Nine Inch Nails has two Oscars. Let's see. What, what, what's a musician you think that would be just insane to like win an Oscar? Weird Al. <laughs> Fucking uh, Nickelback. Oh, yeah, that would be insane. If Nickelback ever <laughs> like... If Nickelback won any award, I'd be, I'd be surprised. Like any like prestigious award. Yeah. It throws me off so much watching um, 2000s movies because uh, the end credit song is always like Nickelback or like Linkin Park. And I'm like, I, how did I forget that? That's how the movie ended. Like, I don't know if you guys have rewatched uh, Spider-Man 1 recently, but that ends on Nickelback song. Yeah. <laughs> Not only does it end on Nickelback song, it's a Nickelback song about Superman, not even <laughs> Spider-Man. Someone fucked up. <laughs> like they're like write a write a like I think they they just got told it's like hey you need to make a song for a superhero movie. It's like okay, it's like I want to fly like Superman, and it was like wrong hero, but okay, like whatever, fuck it, we'll just use it anyway. I mean, you got the red, you got kind yeah, of the blue. Red, Can DC red, blue, sue? Protect the superhero. I don't know. No, uh, I think that's about it though. You ever think about, um, okay, this is unrelated, but it's a tangent I just want to ask uh, you guys. Um, I find it fascinating how, like, throughout history, different superheroes were actually, like, the most popular. Everyone's like, oh, Batman's the most po- famous superhero. Batman only became the most famous hero in, like, the last, like, 20-something years. Prior to, like, the Nolan trilogy and, like, the, the late 90s, like, Batman boom, Superman was actually more popular than Batman. Like, he had more sales, more, like, everything. Um, fucking Jerry Seinfeld. Like, his character in Seinfeld was, like, a Superman fan. Like, there were, like, episodes in TV about people who were Superman fans, but nowadays it would be Batman fans. Like, I find that fascinating how, like, people, like, view Superman as passe now, but, like, no, Superman legit used to be popular in modern times. It was, it was this the last 20 years because, like, there hasn't been, like, any good Superman media up until, like, I guess Superman and Lois, like, that TV show. I heard that's pretty good, but, like, until recently, there, there's, there's been fucking nothing good Superman shit, like, outside of TV. So I was like, oh, maybe speaking that's why. Of, <clears throat> speaking of superheroes, um, can we just acknowledge how this is quite an ambitious crossover? You got Lex Luthor teaming up with the Amazing Spider-Man to create yeah. a website. Actually, I think the, the Lex Luthor comparison, like, people make the joke, but, like, um, straight up, Jesse Eisenberg was copying his performance as Mike Zuckerberg in Batman v Superman. Like, it's the same performance. <laughs> and I think that's, like, really funny. Um... Zack Snyder was like, Mark's, this Mark Zuckerberg guy, he's like a super villain. That's a good idea, actually. Uh, fucking write, write, a <laughs> write that down, write that down. It was, yeah, I was like, it, we're talking about Superman, but like, legit, this guy is basically a Superman villain. This, is, this movie is about a Superman villain origin story. Uh, so I, was, I was not expecting uh, London Tipton from The Sweet Life to appear in this movie. Neither yeah. did I. That caught me off guard. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, wait, is that... Holy shit, it is. Where's the laugh track? <laughs> yeah, it's funny, like, she, and she, like, um, her friend, like, didn't, like, appear again, but, like, her character actually kind of, like, stayed as a side character throughout. Yeah. Um, all I know is her, I don't remember her name, though, like, I, I, I'm pretty sure, like, she's... Chrissy, she's just, like, I think? Girlfriend. Yeah, Chrissy. Yeah. Chrissy. Chrissy okay. But, of course, all the greatest crossover movies have to have some type of tie to Disney Channel. Look at Hoot. Remember? Yes. Um, Jake Ryan there. Now we got London Tipton helping out Lex Luthor and Amazing yeah. Spider-Man. I remember uh, Elvis, greatest movie of uh, all time. That was uh, Austin Butler, Dis- Disney Channel star. Disney Channel is the root of all greatness in cinema. Yeah. Also, Elvis is, I'd argue Elvis is a superhero movie because superhero, his superpower is the ability, is, is literally being cool. That's his superpower. Also, Watch him wiggle um, and he'll win a million bucks. The crowd yeah. goes crazy. Yeah. Also, actually, that's something I want to mention. Um, Elvis, his favorite superhero was Captain Marvel. Really? Huh. Not, not huh. even Captain Marvel. Captain Marvel Jr., his sidekick. Because here's the thing. People don't know this. During, like, the 40s and 50s, Captain Marvel was actually more famous than Superman. The only reason he, um, his popularity went down is because a DC just sued the shit out of him. <laughs> that basically just kind of kneecapped the entire company, and then like DC bought him out. And it was like it's like the most kind of scummy shit ever. But like, yeah, no, uh, Captain Marvel was was actually more famous than Superman for a while, um, which I think is kind of hilarious. And like Elvis was a bigger fan. Like, um, you know Elvis's famous costume with like the half cape. Mm-hmm. That's just Captain Marvel Junior's costume. 
He straight huh. up was just like, he basically just took like the, the superhero costume and just told him to add some like bedazzles on it, and that that's that was Elvis. I want to I want to bedazzle this uh, this outfit for me a little bit. Like, Damn, yeah, can't yeah, yeah, believe right he here. cosplays in the fifties. Yeah, basically, like it, it, like imagine if, like some superhero now was just like uh, what's like a famous sidekick, like, uh, Robin? Robin. No, besides Robin, like who's a uh, I don't know, um, Miles Morales. No, he's his own guy. Yeah, he's his own guy. Does yeah, and, like does Groot count? No, nah, because they're, they're they're like a buddy cop duo. Yeah, they're they're like they're they're a team. They're a full on team. So they don't have sidekicks anymore. That's a shame. Oh. Um. Yeah, I guess they don't. Like, um, like imagine just I don't know. Imagine like some lesser superhero, like um, and then like I don't know who's like the biggest pop. Star? Ariana Grande was just like was just like just started dressing like that, and I was like that'd be kind of funny. <laughs> like Ariana Grande is like I really like I don't know uh, Miles Tails Prower. Yeah, I really yeah, like okay. Tails from Sonic the Hedgehog, and then she just started like wearing like uh, orange like little uh, fox ears, and that became like part of her thing. <laughs> I don't know. I couldn't think of any other sidekicks in modern day. It's weird because like they're like characters that are like associated with each other, but like they're not sidekicks anymore. They're like legacy heroes, or like they pass on the mantle. Because like like Kate Bishop or like X twenty uh yeah, X twenty three, those are like pretty famous like superheroes on their own. But they're not like they're not Hawkeye sidekicks. They're just the next Hawkeye. They're not um. It's kind of the like young, uh, they're the young Padawans. Yeah. Every, basically, everyone's Wally West now. Um, okay, uh, Wally West used to be the Flash's sidekick, and then the Flash got killed off, so for 20 years, Wally West was just the regular Flash, and, um, he actually became more famous than the original Flash, like, Wally West is actually the most famous Flash, and yeah, that's, that's basically what, like, I think every other, a lot of these superheroes are, like, trying to do, where they're, they're trying to, like, uh, re replace the hero with, like, a new blood, and, like, they, they're hoping the new blood is more famous, but, um, Unfortunately, nobody got that Wally West juice, so it never sticks. Even if like the characters are good, like they just end up becoming like their own hero, and like they, it, it's concurrent. Um, granted, that's the thing with like Wally West now. Like Barry Allen's, like they brought Barry ba Allen back to life, but like while they they straight up changed Barry Allen's personality to be more like Wally West. So like the way I see it, there's just two Wally Wests now. It's not Barry Allen never got brought back. They just brought they just made a clone of Wally West and called him Barry. So. I'm sorry. We were talking about the social network, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, there's a lot oh, of yeah, that... stuff in the social network. Yeah. I Justin Timberlake playing this kind of like weird manic pixie uh, dream girl like fucking supervillain is really funny. Um, I like how he has his like how he, they they give him his old like end sync hair. Like he's I love got, that, like, I love like, that whole scene movie. where he first meets Eduardo and Mark at the diet at at the restaurant. And it's all being told from Eduardo's perspective, and it's cutting back between them having a good time and him being like, he was just going on and on. That, that was a great scene. I think it's pretty funny how um, his opening scene uh, was one, when that, that's a cameo with Dakota Johnson, but like, it's, like a, it's like a reveal. It's like, wait, I just slept with the guy who created Napster? It's like, hell yeah. <laughs> you just fucked the guy who created Napster. Yeah, and then, um, are you guys familiar with, the, with Napster? I know of, of Napster. All right. Um, basically, it's like one of the bedrocks of like piracy on the internet. So uh, you have to thank uh, people. Like are like, oh, piracy is a bad thing. The thing is, like, if it wasn't for piracy, a lot of things would generally be lost to time. So thanks, I guess. Also, I think Metallica they threw like a real like pissy fit over Napster and like they kind of uh, destroyed the reputation for like a good. Like, if you remember any of the controversies of Metallica in the two thousands. It was probably because of Napster. Um, but yeah, any other any more thoughts? Luca, you you haven't really done much talking in regards to the movie. You got anything to add or say? I feel fucking bad for Eduardo, man. Yeah. <laughs> One thing I actually find interesting is a lot of people. Um, I remember like uh, around the time people thought it was gonna be like a Winklevoss versus um Zuckerberg, and I actually th I think it's kind of interesting how. They very much portray the Winklevoss twins as assholes too. Eduardo's like the only sympathetic figure in this entire story. Like uh, the I mean, he already twins... has a falling out with uh, Christy. She almost burns his whole apartment, which was fucking insane. Watching a beautiful friendship get destroyed right in front of your very eyes. It's weird. Like this movie is like so good, but it's just hard to kind of like 
discuss why it's like yeah it's got, it's got a like a 10 out of 10 script a really great director that executes the script perfectly a nice little balancing act of like kind of making you empathize with all the characters even though you don't really like any of them except eduardo a lot of some interesting thematic stuff with like it's like watching a car crash not to say the movie's bad i'm just saying like in terms of the character relationships Aaron Sorkin has said that he is absolutely up to make a follow-up if David Fincher would direct it. I'd be down for that, because again, so much shit has happened. So what's he gonna the do? Decade. The metaverse? I don't know. There was that whole court Into trial in 2018. Remember where Mark Zuckerberg drank water and everybody made memes about it? Zuckman I don't remember. Oh wait, 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 wait. Yeah, I do. I do remember now. Zuckman into the metaverse, and they just have Andrew Garfield make a bunch of Spider-Man jokes. Yeah, I guess that's yeah. No, incredibly solid movie. Yeah, I'm happy I finally got to experience this after I haven't heard about it in my entire lifetime. (laughs) Did we really talk about superheroes more than the movie? Evidently, we we did. did. Yeah. Uh. Yeah. This just goes to show you how unprofessional we really are. Um, Probably not our not our sharpest episode. Was like I don't know. There's no. I mean, there's it's always not, something I, fun about the tangents. It's it is good. always fun. It's just so funny, man. This is like a movie where we're generally like, it is too good for us to actually say anything substantial. We don't know it. <laughs> I think it we've had this so problem before with cut. another movie. We, I think we have. It's like, I like the movie, but I don't know what to say. Yeah, like, I don't know. This is why, like, I, I try to, like, anytime I recommend, like, a, a classic, I, I make sure it's, like, the most, like, weird fucking classic ever. Speaking of which... Um, should I do my recommendation? Oh boy, here we go. Um, yeah, all right, what you got? What strangeness awaits? Because we were doing jokes about how you're recommending, uh, how, like, you guys recommended stuff that I would recommend, I decided, I'm still gonna recommend something that I would recommend, because, like, you guys did do stuff that you wanted to, um, but I decided I was gonna do something that I'm pretty sure Lugia would probably recommend. Oh god, this can only mean bad things. Uh, no, it's a good movie. Okay. Uh, we're going to be, uh, I figured, you know, I like David Lynch. Lugia likes Nicolas Cage. Why don't we do the David Lynch, Nicolas Cage movie? So this week I'm recommending Wild at Heart. Okay. Also starring Willem Dafoe. So it's, uh, it's basically got all the actors that Lugia loves. Oh, hell um, yeah. And, you know, I know you like Blue Velvet too. So this is going to be more of that. I get <laughs> Oh boy. I did show that to a couple other people who have never seen the movie and they were weirded the fuck out and I loved every second of it. That's another movie I should yeah. probably give a second watch because it is now, it is better the second time around. Now there are a few things I should probably get covered. I have okay. not seen Wild at Heart, so I don't know what the content warnings are, but you guys remember Blue Velvet. Just go in expecting something bizarre. It's probably gonna take a little bit to get into. From what I understand, somebody, if, movie, if at any point in this movie somebody hides in a closet, I'm getting out. <laughs> yeah. um, apparently, there's a lot of allusions to Wizard of Oz and Elvis Presley, so I guess keep those in mind. I don't know why. Um, and apparently, this one, the Palm Door, expect an insane road trip. Considering it's a road trip and it's really weird and surreal, I'm going in expecting like Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas mixed with Blue Velvet. So um, I'd say go in with those expectations too. I'd also recommend maybe don't watch it the right before, just because like um, Social Network. That's a movie you really understand like on the first go. I feel like this is a movie that you're gonna need to, like sit with for like a little bit, just like All right. knowing. I'll make, David I'll make time. I will yeah. make time. Like I don't know, maybe watch it like on, like Friday. That way you have like two days to like think about it. Wild at Heart, David Lynch, and I think this is our second. Second Lynch film, yeah. Yes. All right. I was expecting something like Eraserhead. Here's the thing, uh, the, the next Lynch movie I wanted to recommend was Lost Highway, and, like, this was, like, my third choice, but, um, I, I figured, like, that because, like, I wanted to do something that, like, you would, one of you two would recommend, I, like, yeah, Wild at Heart, that makes sense. Um, I was also, my second option was, uh, I was thinking about doing, um, Who Framed Roger Rabbit or Chinatown, um, but then I figured, I mean, we just did Back to the Future. I feel like it'd be kind of soon to just go into the Zemeckis well again, so. If you want to choose a movie that Lugia would choose, you go for something from the 90s. You want to choose something I would choose, you go for something from the mid-2000s. Or just pick a fucking Neil Breen film. Or, or anything from 2006. Nah, I'd rather have you, uh, 
be the Breen man. All right. Yeah. Although I'll you did step on my toes by recommending Fred. All right. That's my turf. <laughs> We, we each have our territory. We each have our territory. I mean, there's a lot of overlap, but yeah. Um, I don't I was, know. Part I was of the reason about recommending uh, Tokyo Fist, but like I kind of recommended like a, a a bizarre kind of foreign film like a, a bit back. So yeah. I'll be real. Part of the reason I chose Social Network is because I've been on a trend since the year began of choosing a movie I know you guys will like and choosing a movie I just kind of want to talk about, like like a weird out of nowhere movie. Anyway. Um, and, yeah, you know, I needed to fill. I needed to fill that quota. But no, no, I'm, I'm, I'm glad I saw this. But yeah, I don't know. Maybe look up like a, a plot synopsis or something before you go into the movie, or like a blurb, or watch a trailer. Just because, um, I feel like every time I've gone into like I recommended a weird movie and I didn't, I hadn't seen it before, it, it became a disaster because everyone got so confused. Chunking Express, is that you? Now, the thing is, like, Chunking Express. But I'm a cheerleader. Is that you? I've seen, see, those two are different examples because I actually saw those movies before um, and I just didn't prepare you guys well enough. I was thinking more of like when I recommended The Handmaiden because I, I hadn't seen The Handmaiden before. I went in blind too. And then I was like, I probably shouldn't Honestly, have Honestly, I was fine with The Handmaiden. Yeah, but like it had like that kind of, uh, that kind of like. Yeah, it had the sex scene, kind of, but yeah. I mean. It had like the, the, the torture shit. And, oh, like, the torture scene. Oh yeah, that, that. <laughs> I skipped I that part of the movie. I didn't know the torture was in there. It's so, like, <laughs> I know for a fact that someone's head gets blown up in Wild at Heart because my friend has shown me the clip. So expect a bunch of weird squibs. It's over-the-top violence. I know that's in Wild at Heart. I don't know when it is. I just know it's but in it Wild at Heart. I know it happens. Yeah. I, I haven't recommended a, a movie that I hadn't seen before in a while, so this is going to be fun. When did I recommend Adaptation? I completely forgot I recommended that. Recommended that last year. May, yeah. if memory serves. Yeah, I did. Yeah, I almost know. a I year ago. Forgot. No, because like on my list, I was like, um, maybe I could recommend a Spike Jones movie adaptation. And then I was, then I like, I looked and I was like, oh wait, I already recommended that. <laughs> I like, I just remembered now that oh yeah, I recommended that. Like I was, I was like recommending that adaptation was on my list because I want to recommend a Nick Cage movie, but I want it to be like a weird Nick Cage movie. So a Nick Cage movie. Yeah. But like, like a Nick Cage movie, but like from an artsy guy. Um, I was thinking about maybe doing Raising Arizona too, but uh, I figured uh, the next, if I'm gonna recommend a Coen Brother movie next, I probably um, cause like let's see, I did Burn After Reading, I did Fargo, so I feel like the next logical step is like The Big Lebowski or Miller's Crossing. I guess spoilers, but yeah, I feel like eventually I'm gonna make you guys watch the entire Coen filmography. Yeah, I already have Raising Arizona under my belt, so I'm a uh... One step ahead. My only I'm, step ahead. My only really, step ahead is Oh Brother, Where Art Thou? The only, the only Coen Brother film I haven't seen yet is The Lady Killers, and the thing is, The Lady Killers is a remake. I've seen the original, so in a way, I've seen every Coen Brother film. Actually, I'm bit oh wait, did we end the episode? No. Nope. Oh okay. Um, you have a closing. Refresh. Mm -hmm.